So would you take the 500,000 or would you leave it? Probably take it. Yeah. Okay. Everybody in town took it, except for two people, me and my wife. So um, for years it came down and, and we're interested in this site for a whole variety and of reasons. I get, I'm saying hi to a Stick around if you want. Uh, yeah, 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 hang on, So, uh, so Avil is really interesting for a variety of reasons. A couple key things. Uh, one, the gentrification that's gone on here in the wake of the, well, before that, um, an important oil terminal, right, for, for oil from uh, inland to go out, etc. That's We're going to go see that here next on our next stop. But, um, but the unfortunate leaking of those hydrocarbons into the ground and then migrating down to the town has led to a whole bunch of cleanup and all this and that and 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 knock-on effects so we're interested in that we're interested in this as, as an example of a of a, a small town that's become more of a touristy type town and how do you keep the economy going all that kind of good stuff and for years I would I would try to find someone that could talk about this I'd send you guys in to talk to the um, talk shop owners and everything and for for a while that kind of worked and then and then that sort of didn't because now most of the employees here don't live locally. Most employees now are because of cost and all this kind of stuff. They're they're living in San Luis Obispo or elsewhere. So so that kind of became harder to have you guys get a sense of the history from some of the local folks. And so about I don't know four years ago, I don't know four or five years ago, something like that. I was calling around. I finally got to one of the historical societies, and they said, "Well, you should talk to Pete." And like, who's Pete? Like, Pete knows everything. And like, well, who's Pete? Like, oh, here's the email. And so, so Pete has been very kindly uh, meeting with you guys to start off our trip. And I just say, Pete, tell us about your take on the history of Avila and and issues going on. And then he just goes, and I, I don't need to do any prompting. So that's so. With no further ado, the history of Avila. Well, thank you very much. And I know on your little paper here, you cover it real well. So I'm going to tell you things that aren't in there that are really interesting. Okay, number one, we were the largest oil exporting port in the world from about 1916 to maybe 1936, okay? Now, you know why World War, why did the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor? Because we cut off all their oil, okay? There were Japanese tankers coming into Avila filling up constantly up until within three months of Pearl Harbor, okay? So, this was a huge oil exporting place. Now, also, did you ever see the movie Let There Be Blood? Yeah. That's about the pipeline from the San Joaquin Valley to the sea at Avila. Okay. Now, they built the tank farm in San Luis Obispo to hold all this oil until they could take it up here to the tank farm here. Okay. And that was going along good. And this was, you know, when we were the largest oil exporter. Then a huge fire happened in about 1926. It burnt that whole tank farm in San Luis up. Oil Flaming oil was running from the creek in San Luis to Avila for two weeks, okay? It, they called it the world's largest man-made disaster up to that time, okay? Well, they eventually closed down that pipeline, and they still haven't cleaned it up. Right? <laughs> They're talking about it right now. Okay. So, and what year was that? The fire was like 1926. 1926. They started building the thing in 1910. Um, anyway, so we're going along. World War II comes along. The, the Navy took over the yacht club. Um, you know about the ship Montebello, which is a Union oil ship comes into Avila, the captain goes, this is just weeks after Pearl Harbor, and the Japanese did have 12 submarines stationed from Vancouver to San Diego 
One of them was right here in the Sterile Bay. They were the world's most advanced submarines. And the skipper of the Montebello told Union Oil, hey, I'm not skippering this ship unless I have a naval escort. Well, they fired him, okay? Then his assistant they promoted to captain, which he was, oh yeah, it's dangerous, but this is my chance to be captain, right? <laughs> so the Montebello was sunk off Cambria Cayucas. No where was, we'll be tonight. Where we'll be yeah. Tonight. So, and there were lawsuits afterwards and all this stuff. But the point is, the Japanese had a plan that on Christmas Day, they were going to blow up the pier, that's where you're going next, and they were going to blow up the tank farm. And they actually had one airplane that could catapult off the submarine that could drop a bomb. And they did somewhere in Oregon, they did that. Huh. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a one-time use aircraft. It looks like goes, they can't land it back on the ship, but they can use like a yeah, so long, anyway, long way run. So, but they decided not to do that attack because now the Navy was kind of catching up to them. But can you imagine if they would have attacked Avila? <clears throat> We'd still be celebrating that, right, Ann? <laughs> okay, so, and then another thing, as you were talking about employees not knowing about the Avila history. 80% of our water bills go out of town. We have basically 80 residents and the whole rest are vacation rentals and second homes. Wow. So there's not many currently, cities. Currently. Cur right didn't, now. It didn't used to be that way. Oh, no, no. When I came here, which was in the early 1970s, or actually I came in 68 to go to Cal Poly. When I first moved and worked to Avila, was in the early 1970s, there was the fishing industry, a lot of boats out here. There was the whole oil thing. There was, they were starting to build Diablo Canyon, which was a huge, largest construction project in uh, 11 western states. Okay, so this town used to be a working class town. And when I started my cafe here, which was right at the end of this block, I did it because it was cheap rent. Okay, so I had a French Street restaurant. Remember, French Street used to go through, this is all new, this promenade. And it was really affordable. Okay. Well, nowadays, besides it's all vacation rentals, there's very few fishing jobs left. There's the jobs at the nuclear power plant, a thousand, but people don't live in town anymore very much to, to uh, work out there like they used to. So, now it's, you know, totally dependent on tourism, okay? So you could, now, all that went along, and then they decided, the whole town, of course, that was polluted, because you had your tank farm up on the hill, you had your, at the Cal Poly Pier where you're going next, you had your tankers coming in, and there were 13 lines underneath Front Street. That's the street here. 13 lines. Diesel, regular, kerosene, crude, every oil product they had a line for it tanks up there. Okay, I know a guy that his dad worked up on the hill and his uncle worked out on the pier. So a tanker would come in, and this time they were exporting oil. A tanker would come in Okay, we need a thousand, a hundred thousand gallons of diesel. And up on the hill they'd go, okay, roger that, coming down. They'd send it down. Then they'd call up, how did it go? And they'd go, well, we got 99,000 gallons. In other words, <laughs> a thousand gallons would spill every time they shot some down. But who cared? It was the largest oil exporting in the world. Just shut up and keep working. And that's what happened. Until finally, 
in the 1980s, someone went to get a building permit and they struck oil in the soil sampling and the whole thing took place. So they tore down the town. You guys all know about that. Well, they haven't heard it. They haven't heard it. They haven't heard it. Okay. So from that end of town, all this, this is all new. All of it to over there. And they moved the grocery store and brought it back. And they moved the yacht club and brought it back. The yacht club and was a historic structure, so they yeah, moved it and brought it back. Yeah. Plus, they needed it. The Coast Guard has an observation place. I also wondered why they didn't save the custom house. Because the custom house was just a, a nothing at that time. Well, it was a government facility. Yeah, but I think it hadn't been used. Well, yeah. At any rate, by the time they tore down the house, the town, the custom house was no longer functioning, except as a restaurant. And this is early 90s? Yeah. Okay. So, so that's how we got this town as it is now. All right? So, of course, now, as you guys are going to find out, the big issue is the offshore wind turbines and the Chumash Marine Sanctuary and how it's going to fit in and what's that going to do to Port and to Avalon. Okay, so that's the big question right now. So, what I like to say is, hey look at it. We're the largest oil exporting spot in the world. Diablo Canyon was handling 20% of California's energy. We built the Topaz Solar Farm in the east in the Carissa Plains. That was another 20%. And what do we get for doing all that? The highest gas price in the nation. <laughs> Is that crazy? <laughs> they should be giving us gas. You should be able to show your Avala ID and get free gas. <laughs> so anyway, that's basically what uh, where we are right now. And it's very, very complicated. I haven't decided anything yet because we don't really know what's going to happen yet. But right now, like I say, former allies, the Chumash and the offshore wind, are now turning on each other. So, so, the, so, so we're clear, um, right? The oil spill comes down and litigation, litigation, litigation. Ultimately, the oil company has to, Unical has to mediate for it, right? And they determine to clean up the soil, correct me if I'm wrong, clean up the soil, you have to, it's, you can't just like dig a tunnel into these houses, so you got to basically knock the facilities down so you can scoop up the contaminated soil to take it to a certified landfill, put in new soil, etc. So in the process, the company essentially buys the property and does their stuff, and ironically, it takes so long because of the permitting and just the technology and all that kind of stuff, that when they ultimately go to put stuff back, they probably made money. Wow. I would say they did. In terms of the did, property values. They did. Um, now, of course, when all this was going on, there were multiple lawsuits. Suing Union Oil, blah, blah, blah. Um, a lot of people made a good bit of money off those lawsuits. But... They can't divulge how much they got because then Union Oil can take back their money. Wait, what? How does that work? That works where I go, okay, Mr. Smith, we bothered you all this time, so therefore we're giving you $500,000 for your trouble. But you can't tell anybody how much you got. Take it or leave it. It's called the non-disclosure. Oh, so would you take the 500000 or would you leave it? Probably take it. Yeah. Okay. Everybody in town took it, except for two people, me and my wife. Wow. <laughs> my wife, because she was too busy to take it, and me, 
because I was too pissed off. <laughs> so, but that means I can talk about anything. Yeah. <laughs> they have nothing over me. So, so that's where we are now, right? So now we've converted from a, a working, uh, working eco or you know, diverse economy, different sectors, to now pretty much mostly a tourism sector here, for, by and large. And so, what else, what other changes have you seen with uh, with, uh, with that? So, so summertime, a gazillion million people. Wintertime, kind of empty. What, what other, what other well, use, use use changes have you seen over the years? Okay, number one is. Everybody goes, God, Applet, it's so crowded. So in this one lecture I have, I show pictures of the cars parked here from like 1915 all the way to the 60s. Right in, there are plenty of days when Avila was more crowded than it is now in 1920s. Okay? So, tourism, well, and another thing is, you know, we had the narrow gauge railroad. So in, in, let's say this was 1895 and you had five dollars, you could hop on the train in San Luis Obispo, ride it out to Port Harford, get on a freighter, a steam passenger ship with accommodations, end up in San Francisco the next day for five bucks. For five bucks? For five bucks. Wow. Okay? So therefore, we never should have got rid of that road. <laughs> they tore it down for scrap iron. That would have solved many of our problems. Okay. But we did get rid of it. And now we have, it gets very congested around here. But I said it's always been congested around here. But that leads to other problems. For instance, how do we get the hell out of here if there's an emergency at the nuclear power plant? Oh, you're screwed. There's only one way out. Oh. Well, there's not even any boats. <laughs> I mean, we could have forced PG&E to buy a 800 car ferry and leave it out there at all times and it would have been sitting there for the last 40 years. And you've heard all this before. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> so anyway, um, now your professor's right. What it's boiling down to philosophically, do you want to see a blue collar port with plenty of jobs? Or do you want to see playland for the rich where the only economy is real estate speculation? Well, obviously, there'll be something in between. But it's some, it's some way to think about it, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to be around to see it. But I wouldn't care if Avila turned into a port like it was. A working port. A working port years ago. But I don't think the majority want that, you know? And I don't know if I even want it. But philosophically, that might be the choice we're going to come down to. One thing that's become quite uh, important with CEQA and all this kind of stuff, Coastal Commission, are these view sheds, right? And so the idea there is a shared resource is, you know, like, like, like a nice view is, is an important resource, um, but, which, is, which is true, but what is, what is considered nice or what is considered aesthetic it's hard to pin down, right? So some people say a windmill is horrible. Other people say a windmill is cool. Some people say fishing boats are horrible. Other people say fishing boats are cool. So um, it's often treated in the law as if it's very clear what a desirous view shed is or, or a desirous view. But I think it's very culturally determined, very, very driven by what the current fads are and what the current population is as opposed to sure. a pristine, perfect target. And then besides, you guys all remember nights on the beach, maybe with a little fire on the beach, staring out at those offshore rigs in the Santa Barbara Channel. And they're beautiful at night, you know. And every once in a while, one will flare up. And <laughs> you're going, right? That's part of your culture. Yeah, yeah. It's part of my culture. 
Yeah. But uh, that's what happens. So the wind turbines are a whole different monster. There's going to be an entanglement of cables out there. Oh, yeah. I don't get how a wind turbine on a flittable device. How what? How it, I, I don't understand how, like, based on what you're saying, how big they are and how they would construct a floatable platform that's floating. Yeah, they're not tethered to the bottom. Yeah. Well, they're anchored to the bottom. They're anchored. Yeah, but they're going to get dragged around. Yeah, but they're, they're, get... they're floating. In other words, they're, they're not really anchored to the bottom. I thought they were. I thought, I thought they were they're the floods and ballast, and then they have like sort of. Well, yeah, at any rate, I'm not sure. It's there too. And I but did. there's certainly, it's not, it's not like the current wells that are a big superstructure to the ground. Definitely not that kind of stuff. It's too deep for that. So, so you know, they were saying that, oh, you know, some of these companies that bought leases back east are now bailing out. Okay, and that was big news yeah. last week when these companies that are going to do this thing were here and they had a series of lectures. So they were bailing out back east and then I guess they offered some wind energy land in the Gulf of Mexico to lease the feds hmm. and no one bid on it. And now try to imagine. A category five hurricane, <laughs> what it would do to all those windmills. You know what I mean? We'd have windmills yeah. flying to Mars. Yeah, yeah. I mean part of the part of the problem is there hasn't been as much uh, mo most of our energy infrastructure, think of oil and gas, has been pretty heavily subsidized with tax credits and oh, various yeah. things. That's not happened Nuclear. with yeah, that's most the, subsidies. Right. Totally. That's not happened with wind by and large. What has happened is the the turbines that we have on land. These ones that are out at sea are much bigger, and so it's it's uh, there's an economy of scale thing there. Once you have a, a thousand offshore windmills, you have the industry and people that can make it. But in that transition period where we are now, which is you kind of need to show they work, and then you first have them for a bit, so it's very expensive. And so what we the policy we've chosen to go forward with is just. Um, have these guys finance, have these companies finance it themselves, as opposed to subsidizing the infrastructures we have other energy industries. So that was, that was potentially fine for the first few decades, but now that interest rates have gone up super, super high, it doesn't, it doesn't pencil out now that the interest rates are 7% as opposed to the 2, 3% they were for a long time. And that, that's when the industry wore up. So what Pete's talking about is people are re-looking at this long-term commitment because it's going to be, you know, a decade or so before you actually get enough juice to sort of start making money. So you need to be financing all that uh, for, you know, years to get going. So, so that, that's not the only problem, but that's, that's turning out to be in the last couple of years, a huge challenge for the offshore, the deep offshore industry. Why don't they just use the oil, decommission uh, oil platform? You could, but that's only a handful. There's only 27 well, why don't platforms. You start with that though, and see how it goes. They're not always in the right place. Yeah, they're not in the right spot. So one of the reasons, one of the reasons, yeah, we'll, we'll see sense. when we go to one of the reasons. So there's only two. So the bureaucracy is, as we've talked about, one of the key challenges is the bureaucracy, and that's that's a very very real uh, challenge. And so uh, you know. We could have been doing offshore wind for decades, but, but we've made it so hard to permit. Same with offshore aquaculture and all these other things. Yeah. So, so Diablo Canyon was supposed to be phasing down. Diablo Canyon has all these giant power lines coming to this part of the coast that don't go to Point Conception or don't go to wherever, right? So there's a natural infrastructure point here, and it's windy. Um, uh, it's windy elsewhere, but you need to have all these things lined up. You need to have the infrastructure and the wind and the ports and the and the and the and the and, the, and, the, and so that's that's why this spot was deemed a, a potential spot. And we are 
windy, especially where they're going to put these windmills. But and also we have really, really cold water. Do any of you people pay to get attention to ocean temperature? Yeah. Okay. For a long while, maybe for the last two months, the Diablo Canyon buoy would be 58 degrees and every other buoy from San Francisco down to the Mexican border would be over 58 degrees. In other words, we were the coldest spot on the whole coast. And that's still true. It's still working out that way, although warmer waters are creeping up because of El Nino. But usually those, you don't really see a strong effect of that until February, March. Now, the weather media though talks about it all the time. So this storm that's coming up this week, if it rains more than an inch, they'll say it was an El Nino storm. <laughs> now was it? I don't think so. But that's what you're gonna hear from now until doomsday. And we flooded severely last year. And we had a lady drowned and everything. Yeah. So it was terrible. I've heard you speak before on Avenue. Okay, then you're invited to listen to me again. <laughs> well, thank you. you obviously didn't interrupt me or you wouldn't be around. <laughs> Over did you. I did want to make a point about the temperature, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Before we moved here we checked the National Weather Service. And we were comparing it to the coast, but San Diego, Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara, South Jason Beach, Avalon Beach, South Jason, those three cities, year-round average daily high is within one degree. Avalon Beach, 71, year-round high, August 78, low, December 62. And, and, and uh, Santa Barbara, San Diego are within one degree. And uh, I was, picture climate. <laughs> picture climate. It's a wonderful climate, and I was referring to the ocean temperatures. Okay. Oh. Just okay. the ocean temperature. Agree, the ocean gets colder. Yeah, but as far as land temperatures, I mean, this is one of the best climates in the world. Yeah. We're normally less foggy than any place on the central coast. This summer, we were as foggy as any place. And this fall, we had a very, very cool summer and fall. And I've never seen the place more foggy. Now, they say that's what's going to happen with climate change. I'd say it's, it's unclear. The, the, so half the models say it's going to happen, the other half say it's going to go the other way. It's, it's unclear. Well, it's going to go too hot if you're inland. And I'm talking about, I would call San Luis Obispo inland. Right at the coast, they say it's going to be more foggy. Now, that was certainly true this last summer, so I don't know. But would I rather be foggy or would I rather be it to be 100 degrees? I'd rather be foggy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Totally. Totally. So, as, someone that, as someone that was born in Daly City, I totally agree that it's foggy. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> well, Daly City, you remember in Redwood City over El Camino, they had a sign saying, Climate best by government test. And that went over El Camino as you went through Redwood City which is approaching David. Yeah, 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 yeah. 